Welcome to Learn Law Better. Ever wondered what really happened in the torts classic, Paul's Graph vs. Long Island Railroad? Today I will provide you with the rest of the story, and after that the rule from the case. Hi, this is Bo Byers, and today I'm going to help you understand Paul's Graph vs. Long Island Railroad, a 1920s New York State case that is read by law students around the world. The opinion was written by Benjamin Cardozo, one of the great jurists of the 20th century. Here is Cardozo's version of the injury. Helen Paulsgraf was waiting to catch a train when suddenly there was an explosion near her, which caused a penny scale to fall down on her. The explosion occurred when two men attempted to board a moving train. One of the two men got on without difficulty, but the second man looked like he was going to fall. The second man was carrying a nondescript package wrapped in newspaper. To keep the man from falling, one railroad conductor on the train pulled him up, while the second conductor on the platform pushed him onto the moving train. In that process, the package, which happened to contain fireworks, fell down, causing an explosion on the tracks. Cardozo's facts leave much to be desired. Here is the rest of the story based on the trial documents, all of which Cardozo had access to. First, there was another package of fireworks found on the train station from a third unidentified man who did not make it onto the train. The firework we're talking about was 18 inches long and four inches in diameter. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a bomb to me. Apparently, during that time, the press called it a firework because they were concerned of panic and possible bomb attacks in New York City. Second, Helen Paul's graph suffered minor bruises, but significant psychological harm. For the rest of her life, Helen Paul's graph spoke with a stutter and had to stop working as a maid because she was scared to leave her home. Third, the fireworks didn't explode immediately upon impact but rather the train dragged them along the tracks right up to where Mrs. Paulsgraf was sitting, exploding 10 feet away from her. Fourth, the case was argued by both plaintiff and the defendant as a proximate cause case. Cardozo ignored the proximate cause issue and came up with a completely different rationale for ruling against Helen Paulsgraf, a theory that neither party discussed in briefs nor at oral argument. By the way, the railroad lost the proximate cause argument at the Intermediate Court of Appeals because it was a lousy argument. The railroad's argument was that the passenger's negligence was an intervening cause that broke the railroad's causal link. But that was a silly argument as the passengers were negligent before the railroad's negligence. You can't have an intervening event that comes before the railroad's negligence. By all accounts, Helen Paulsgraf had a slam dunk case in her favor at New York's High Court. Fifth was Helen Paulsgraf's lawyer. He was a high-powered New York lawyer who was not known for taking tort cases, let alone a case on contingency from a poor maid. This lawyer practiced in the Woolworth Building in New York City, which was the world's tallest building at the time. To this day, we don't know why he took this case. All right, now let's move on to the law. Cardozo's majority opinion determined that the railroad owed no duty of care to Helen Paulsgraf because she was not within the range of apprehension. In other words, she was not a foreseeable plaintiff, and foreseeable plaintiffs are determined under the duty element, not the proximate cause element. In this case, the railroad conductors were clearly negligent to the passengers they unreasonably helped onto a moving train. But as to Helen Paulsgraf, there was no reason for the conductors to believe that a package wrapped in newspaper would explode, thus moving her outside the range of apprehension. If Helen Paulsgraf was to sue anyone, Cardozo suggested she should have sued the two passengers who were never identified by the police. The Andrews dissent argued that the duty element should be interpreted much more broadly to include all injured victims and that foreseeability should then be determined under proximate cause. Andrews also noted that the defendant never asked the jury to determine if Helen Paul's graph was a foreseeable plaintiff, which the jury should have determined as a matter of fact. 
what Cardozo should have done in this case was remand the case back to the trial court on the factual issue of whether Helen Paulsgraf was a foreseeable victim. But Cardozo precluded that possibility by saying that both sides conceded the point of unforeseeability. Therefore, the court could rule on the unforeseeable plaintiff issue as a matter of law. After the opinion was issued, Paulsgraf's attorney filed a motion for reconsideration, pointing out that Helen was only 10 feet away from the explosion. Cardozo denied the motion, stating in one sentence that while she may have been close to the explosion, she was not close to the spot where the conductors negligently caused the package to fall onto the tracks. And there you have it, the rest of the story and rule from Paul's graph. If you'd like to see more episodes that can help you succeed, hit the subscribe button. Also, don't forget to check out learnlawbetter.com where you will find more resources to help you succeed, including my blog, newsletter, and exam bank. Thanks for watching.